Service. It is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. So APHIS is sort of, I think, a little unsung um, public agency, but it is the uh, federal agency that is helping to track particularly agricultural and other pests that are coming into the country when we're seeing box tree moth come over from Canada and we need to put quarantines in place or we need to take action. It's often APHIS that's behind that. So Sawyer actually graduated from UNH and has a background in environmental conservation and sustainability and has been with APHIS now for a few years. And she is in uh, working directly with the emerald ash borer biocontrols. So it's a little different to switch from aquatics to our emerald ash borer, but we have partners who are interested in all topics here. And so Sawyer, if you can see if you can share your screen, that would be great. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sawyer. Thanks so much. All right, hello. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you great. Cool. Um, one second. OK, well, there we go. All right, so I work with uh, EAB, and it's a very rewarding job. Um, so just real quickly, when I go to a site, I look for areas that have woodpecker holes and blonding. Sometimes I'll see blonding, but that does not always mean that EAB is present. I'll also look for epicormic growth and crown class on the bottom left um, picture. You can see that's a, it's a good example of what I would like to see in the site. There are some- Boyer, can I interrupt signs. for just a second? Um, yep. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, we're just getting some echo. Would you be able to maybe is there a different sound system you could use or headset? Um, let me see. OK. And then maybe turning your video off will help save bandwidth. We can all turn our video yeah, off too to save bandwidth. Going through, I don't know what you're going through. Sorry. Um, but anyway, so I look for places that have a crown class average of about two. And in the bottom left hand corner, you can see the site has a good mix of healthy trees, but it also has some trees that don't look so good. And one of the reasons why I want a site like this is because you don't want to go to an area that has completely dead trees, since that means that EAB populations have probably already come through, maybe even moved on, or the populations will crash really quickly. So if you release parasitoids there, there won't be enough food for them to eat in the long run. That being said, you also don't want a site that looks 100% healthy either, because if EAB is there, their populations might be so low that parasitoid populations won't be sustained. So you kind of want to find the happy middle, which can be very frustrating. Um, but that's also why I look for woodpecker holes with blonding or epicormic growth. I also will sometimes look for other signs such as EAB galleries, EAB larva, or even exit holes. These three signs are a lot harder to find. Galleries and larva are more difficult because you have to peel the ash tree. And sometimes I'll see a tree that looks like it might have EAB signs. And then I don't find any galleries or any larva. And then I'll also, will get ash trees that I'm really unsure of. And then all of a sudden, I'll find like 10 galleries. Um, you also might not always see larva because it does kind of depend on when you feel sometimes. Another sign are exit holes. And these can be incredibly difficult to find. Typically, when EAB is new to an area, they'll work from top down. So you might not always see exit holes high up in the canopy. They're also very small. And sometimes it's easy to get confused with other insects. I'll look at a hole and I'm like, oh, is it EAB? And then it's not. I've also peeled on top of what I think are exit holes, and then I don't see any galleries. Um, but if you do see them, it means EAB is definitely there. And that's another huge consideration I take when I look at a new site. All right, so I work with three species of parasitoids. The first one is Spathius galini. It's our largest parasitoid. It's originally from Russia, which is super nice. Um, 
because that habitat is a little bit closer to ours in the sense that it gets really cold there. So there is hope that Spatius galini will overwinter well. The dispersal is suspected to be good. Um, it targets EAB larva. It has a lifespan of 10 to 12 weeks, and its ovipositor is quite long. And this is really important because it means that this parasitoid is better suited for some of the larger ash as it can get through some of the thicker bark. So Trasticus panopenici is the second parasitoid I work with. It's originally from China. Um, its dispersal is also su suspected to be good. It targets EAB larva as well. It has a lifespan of about 10 weeks, and the ovipositor is much shorter, so it's better suited for the smaller ash trees where the bark isn't quite as thick. And then finally, Obisagrilli, the smallest parasitoid I work with, uh, is from China. Its dispersal is unknown. I've read in places that it's not as good because it's a very small parasitoid, but I've also heard that it can disperse. Um, it targets EEB eggs instead of larva, and it has a lifespan of about two to three weeks. And the ovipositor is very small. All right, so I get the parasitoids on three different ways. One of them is ash vaults, and for Tetrasticus and Galini, the larva come in ash vaults. Um, all ash vaults have been infested with EAB, so that's just something that I like to let people know before I go and release them. But the really cool thing about ash vaults is sometimes if you go back, you can see parasitoids walking all over them. You can also see holes where they have emerged. And sometimes if you go back like a year or two later and you kill the ash vaults, you can actually find the EAB galleries. And this is a really good example of where an EAB larva died from parasitoids. And if you look at the circle, there's actually the head of the larva. So that was a really cool find. And also, um, after two years of releases, when we go back and we try to recover parasitoid populations, one method you can use is peeling. And this is kind of what you want to look for when you do peel an ash tree. The second mechanism is an ovinator. It's just a medicine bottle. And it's for obesity larva. They are on coffee filter paper, and it has EAB eggs that are parasitized on the paper. It's really small, and sometimes um, when you go back, you can actually see the obese walking around the medicine bottle. So that's also super cool. And then finally, cups. So. The cubs are for all three species of adults with obvious, so put coffee filter paper on top or like underneath the lid so that way they can't escape. Sometimes they do. I've had them escape in my office before. Um, and sometimes there's also honey placed in the cup for parasitoids to feed on. They also get stuck, so when I get the cubs, I have to be extra careful and not jostle them around too much. All right, so for release sites, the green flags are first year releases, so that will be Berlin State Forest and Beaver Pond State Forest. The yellow flags are second year releases completed in 2021, so that will be Lincoln Mountain, Cherry Plain, South Mountain. And then I have two landowners, one in Roxbury and one in Margaretville. And then the red flags are second year releases completed in 2020, so that will be Moreau, um, a landowner in Fly Creek, Paulson Preserve, Landowners in Deposit and Andes, and then Kinderhook Creek Nature Preserve. Some of these sites I had to break up because of COVID, so I wasn't able to go to some of them, so I finished those releases this year. And then for the past three years of releases, um, 2020 had one new site, 2021 had two new sites, one of them was in Delaware County, one of them was in Rensselaer, and I managed to release quite a few parasitoids over the span of three years. There was a decline in parasitoids because of COVID, and the Michigan lab wasn't able to keep up with the amount of people interested in the program. So that's why you see a little bit of a decline with some of the releases here. Um, 
And then looking by county, there was quite a big shortage of OBS. I did not get any adult OBS, whereas in the past couple of years I have. I also used to get adult Tetrasticus, um, but I was not able to get quite as many adult Tetrasticus. And even Galini, there seems to be a little bit of a shortage there as well. Thankfully, I didn't have too big of a mortality rate. The first year I was on, I got a shipment that got delayed by like four days, and I think 80% of those parasitoids died. Um, but thankfully, that did not happen this year. So that was good. And then finally, I have a map from State Parks. They just wanted to mention that they released parasitoids again in Point Roche and Southwick Beach. They are on their second year of releases. So next year, they will go back and try to retrieve parasitoids and see if they have established. And again, you can do that by peeling bark, or you can also use yellow pan traps. And then Cat Cartier State Park had its first year of releases. Um, so that was pretty cool. And I know that up in Canton, there's an integrated pest management program. I was not able to pull data, but they did uh, second year releases in Robert Moses and Coles Creek State Park. They're also using um, insecticides as well. I'm not sure what type, but they're trying to look at if insecticides can be used with parasitoid releases to try and help save areas. The idea being that the insecticides will kind of protect the trees short term or long term until parasitoid populations can establish. Um, and I do not believe they have started to recover parasitoid populations as they are also, they've just completed their second year of releases. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? Any questions out there through for Sawyer about EAD? Um, I think Becca Bernacki uh, also earlier this year or earlier in her presentation noted that APIP had five emerald ash borer traps up this summer. And we did find one new infestation in sort of the Bolton area, which was uh, sad to know, um, as well as the one over in the western edge of Warren County. And APIP is also working with USDA to think about some biocontrol releases next year. It's quite the competitive process to get the biocontrols. You can't just go out on the street and, uh, and buy those, uh, those coffee filters that Sawyer mentioned or those uh, infested logs. So um, we're really hoping to see if, if I really love this presentation because it shows between the northern area and what's happening with all of the releases in the capital district that Sawyer talked about. We're really trying to see if these biocontrols can get established on the perimeter areas of the park. So um, somebody had a question of whether there was any EAB controls going on up at the Aquasazmi Reserve. Um, Becca, I know that the, there are representatives of the tribes in the EAB working group, but I don't know if they're doing any biological controls yet. So I know um, that... oh, sorry. That's why you probably know more than I do. Last I heard, they have two sites there. And I believe they got at least two shipments of parasitoids. And just to build on that, you know, in addition to control, they've been doing a lot of surveying and monitoring up there as well. They've been very on top of it. Um, it's a big concern for them. I would say too on the parasitoids, um, Sawyer, have you done any recoveries yet in the in the capital region work? I know in the northern work, it's too early to see whether any of them have survived, um, but have you been able to recover any active alive ones? I started to um, in one of my sites, Paulson. I didn't find anything, but I think that's because I was a little bit too late in the season with the parasitoid releases. 
it gets quite busy. But next year, I'm hoping that I can dedicate more time to looking for parasitoids in each area. I think that is great. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know earlier today, our partners from the New York State Hemlock Initiative were on the call. And they also have a slide that's in the slide deck of the partner slide deck. And that um, when we did the HWA training in Lake George a few weeks ago, Mark Whitmore was talking about how it's really hard to find those biocontrols once they're released. I mean, as you can see of some of the things that Sawyer was showing, some of these biocontrols are very small. So it's almost like a needle in a haystack or a little microscopic, um, or not microscopic, but a very small insect amongst the large ash trees. So it'll be really interesting to see what you're able to find. Other questions for Sawyer about these emerald ash borer release uh, biocontrol releases? Uh, Susan, go ahead. Um, what is the timing or the relationship between the insecticide injected in the trees and introducing parasitoids? So I think um, they put the insecticides let's see, sometime, I want to say in June, and that's at the beginning of the season. And then they released once the growing degree days are warm enough where parasitoids won't die because it's too cold. Um, so I think the insecticides are injected right around the same time that you would begin parasitoid releases. And that's also kind of timed. We also put up traps in a lot of the areas to see if EAB is there. And then the traps are timed with the EAB flight season. And that's kind of like late spring, early summer. So does that mean that the insecticide doesn't have much effect on the parasitoid? It doesn't. Um, so the insecticide won't actually impact the parasitoid because the parasitoids use vibrations in the trees from the EAB larva. And if the larva is dead, they can't detect it. So the parasitoids aren't harmed from the insecticide. And the only reason why they're one of the main reasons why they're using the insecticide is because parasitoid populations take a very long time to establish. So they want to see if insecticides can kind of help those ash trees until the parasitoid populations can establish. And there's a long-term goal, and then there's also a short-term goal to kind of see how long it takes parasitoid populations to establish. Once those populations are there, then they'll stop using the insecticides for the most part and let the, e, or let the parasitoids take over. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for Sawyer about the EAB parasitoids? Um, I wanted to ask Sawyer, you had mentioned, you know, the hope is that you can, if you have certain ash trees that you want to try and do the pesticide treatment for, you can do that hoping for the biocontrols to establish. Um, is the hope that they'll establish within two years or three years or sort of what's the, what are you looking for in terms of establishment? Year three, year four? Um, it's still pretty early in some places to kind of tell what establishment really means. But I think the hope is that you go back and each year you see parasitoids are still there. I'm not really sure on the timeline of it all, but I think for the most part, you know, you go back after, or like year three and you see parasitoids, you go back year four and you continue to see parasitoids and you continue to see the population grow as well. Thanks for that. These, uh, these EAB release sites, we are looking at, um, as the ones that we have looked into, are looking at uh, basically a five-year program with releases in the first few years and then monitoring in the latter years. 
And to quickly jump off of that, I was working with EAB when I was in college, and I got to help release parasitoids. And when I came, or later in the fall, we actually cut down a lot of trees and we peeled a lot of ash trees to look for signs of parasitoids in EAB galleries. And I actually managed to find um, a gallery that had a whole bunch of parasitoids in it. So they do, when they are released, they do go in and they do their job and it's super rewarding to see even if it is like a couple months after they were released. So there is hope there. That is exciting. Um, and Becca, do you want to mention a little bit more about the MAMA plots? Because that's the other front that uh, we're working on with EAB. Yeah, so the MAMA protocol was developed by the Ecological Research Institute, I believe is their name, their acronym is ERI. And it's a citizen science project. Uh, you can go on their website and, and watch some videos of trainings that they've recorded. And the MAMA plots are only one small portion of it. So they do have um, an, an initial phase where you go out and look for EAB. And that's probably the phase we're in for a lot of sites within the Adirondacks. They have the kind of second phase, which is the MAMA plots, um, which we've started establishing. And then they have a third phase where you can go out and look for lingering ash after emerald ash borer has established in your area. So what we do to establish the mama plots is we go out and we find an area that has about 40 ash tree, mature ash trees, so about so over four inches uh, diameter at breast height. And those ash trees can be spread um, across an area as small as a half an acre or as large as 10 acres. What we do is we tag those trees so that we can find them next year. Um, we take their GPS coordinates and then we do a canopy assessment. So we rate the canopy on a scale of one to five, depending on if it's really healthy or if it's completely dead and there are different indicators throughout that phase. Um, we also look for signs and symptoms of EAB. So is, are, is there blonding? Are there D-shaped exables? That sort of thing, we mark that down. We'll go back year after year and monitor those plots until we reach a certain mortality threshold. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what that is. I believe it's 95%. And once you reach that mortality threshold, which hopefully plays a long way away in a lot of our plots, it tells us we've, we've reached a point in that, that area where most of the trees are dead from EAB. So any, so any ash tree that's left likely has some degree of genetic resistance. And the US Forest Service um, has a great program where they're breeding genetic resistance into ash trees. So hopefully, you know, ash don't go the way of our elms and our chestnuts. Um, back when, uh, you know, we were told to cut the, the trees and get the timber value out of them while you can, you know, we've kind of learned from that um, where we, we lost any trees that had genetic resistance for those pests. Hopefully we can, we can continue to have our ash on our, lawn, our landscapes through those breeding programs. Thanks for that, Becca. Uh, I know that last summer when we got the first reports of emerald ash borer in the Adirondack Park, um, it definitely made my heart sink. And as I went to see some of those trees, it was, um, it was sad. And you really began to think about uh, the effects of climate change and the effects on our landscape. And now looking into it at this summer, I feel like, okay, well, we have emerald ash borer and we probably knew that it was coming. But now that we have such a great number of these biocontrol sites and the resistant ash project going on, and I'm going to make a plug for the Don't Move Firewood materials that uh, Emily Bell helped put together this summer and that many of you are distributing, I really feel like we have a much better prognosis for the ash trees in the Adirondacks than we did about a year ago. And yes, Emily Bell has thousands. We have thousands of Don't Move Firewood rack cards and posters. Um, it's a good time of year to remind everyone you know to not move firewood as they're getting ready for their winter camps and their winter firewood. Um, any other questions out there, either for Sawyer or for any of our other presenters? <laughs> 